Good morning. My name is Orly Culverhouse, and I am the Caring Hearts Children's Program Counselor at St. Joseph's Hospice in Sarnia, Ontario. Um, and today we're going to be talking about talking to children about substance use related deaths. This was a webinar that we offered live on February uh, the 24th, 2022. And this recording is going to be made available on the St. Joseph's Hospice YouTube channel as a resource for families and professionals who are wanting to learn more about how to talk to children about substance use disorders um, and when there has been a death uh, from a substance use disorder. Um, so just before we get started, I guess just to talk a little bit about um, a content warning or a trigger warning, we are going to be talking obviously about substance use disorders and addiction, about uh, sudden and traumatic loss via accidental overdose and suicide. So just a reminder that as you watch this uh, video, just to take care of yourself, if you need to take breaks, that's totally fine. Um, and uh, just to be aware that that's what we're going to be talking about for the next little bit. So our agenda for today, we're going to talk about how to talk about substance use to children. Um, this idea of to tell or not to tell. Um, a lot of families, when they're in the aftermath of a substance use related death, uh, there's a, a big struggle or a concern about whether or not we should actually uh, tell a child that a death has been as a result of substances. So we're going to talk about some different considerations about, uh, about when you're trying to make that decision. Uh, we're going to talk about disenfranchised grief and children's interpretation of de death very briefly and then actually get into the breaking it down and how do we actually have this conversation of explaining that there has been a death uh, from substance use to children and we'll, we'll break everything down for you and then we'll talk about some different resources that are available uh, for families and for professionals if they want to learn more. Uh, when we did offer this webinar live, we had a huge response. Uh, there was people from all over Southwestern Ontario, um, and we had a mix of family members or community members and professionals. So I'm hoping that this information will be helpful um, to everyone or anyone who uh, joins us today. And I just want you to know if you are in the aftermath of a, a death from substances, um, just to let you know that we, we see you. This is not an easy topic to discuss. It's very stigmatized. And I just want to thank you for trusting me with your time and your energy today. So before we get kind of into our material, I just want to uh, briefly let you know about uh, the hospice and some of its services. So I'm a member of the supportive services team um, and there's a variety of services available to uh, residents of Lambton County. We have uh, individual counseling that's available both in person and virtually right now. Uh, we have our adult bereavement program where we run bereavement groups. Uh, we have the Caring Hearts Children's Program, which includes that individual counseling, but there's also support groups. Um, and we have some special events throughout the year. Uh, the one that's coming up uh, most like soon will be our kids camp in the summer. Uh, we have our Living Life Well program uh, for people who are uh, living with a life limiting illness and the people who are caring for them. Uh, we offer music therapy in our residents and in some of our other programs. Uh, we offer public education which is webinars or um, presentations like this uh, but we also do individual consultations. We can send uh, or organizations resources. Um, we're trying to really make ourselves the hub of all things death, dying, and bereavement in Sarnia. Um, and then we also have a lending library that's available to any community members. Uh, you can, I mean, you can't really walk in right now because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but you don't have to be a client of ours to access or borrow a book from our lending library. Uh, we also, um, so I'm on the, the resource side of hospice, which is available uh, through Christina Street, but we also have a residential hospice, which is attached to the resource center um, and is located on Water Street in Sarnia. And we have 10 residential hospice beds, and we also have a, um, um, a clinic, a patient clinic that's located across the street where people who have a life-limiting illness can be followed um, by their physician through um, through their illness and maybe their journey either to die at home or to die at hospital or here at hospice with us. So why is this an important conversation for us to be having right now? Um, in my uh, time 
doing some research on um, death from substances just since the beginning of the pandemic. There were several, um, these are all kind of headlines. Some of them are local, um, some of them are more federal. Uh, McLean's is uh, from like across Canada. The Observer is obviously a local Sarnia paper. Um, and we're talking about um, not just at the federal level seeing increases in substance use related deaths, but we're also seeing them at the provincial level and unfortunately at um, our local uh, community level in Sarnia Lambton. And I mean, we had already been talking about an opioid crisis before the COVID-19 pandemic hit. Um, and then in 2020, after we saw COVID-19 come to Canada, um, we saw a 60% increase in deaths from substances up from 2019 in Ontario. Um, and unfortunately, that number is fairly true for Lambton County. We saw in 2020 opioid deaths nearly doubled, according to Lambton Public Health. Um, just anecdotally, I can tell you that we have seen increasing numbers of people and of families coming uh, through our doors at hospice seeking support in that aftermath after a substance use related death. And I think the real overwhelming response that we had to this webinar when we offered it live is also kind of an indicator that we need to have more conversations like this, that this is really important. So just some general information when we're thinking about talking about substance use. Um, throughout my uh, research, the term substance use disorder and addiction seem to be used kind of interchangeably depending on uh, what source you're reading. Um, so just know that the, those two terms might be used interchangeably throughout this presentation. Um, the National Institute of Drug Abuse defines addiction or substance use disorder as a chronic relapsing brain disease that is characterized by compulsive drug seeking and use despite harmful consequences. Um, or another definition from CAMH would be that addiction can be broadly defined as, condition, as a condition that leads to a compulsive engagement with a stimuli despite negative consequences, which can lead to physical or psychological dependence. This is a resource from CAMH. When we're talking about substance use, uh, a way to kind of break it down and remember or understand um, is by using the four C's, that there's an element of craving, that there's this idea of loss of control around the amount or the frequency of use, there is a compulsion to use, and there's continued use despite the consequences. Um, so, a large part of my role here at hospice is taking information from the adult world and translating it into child friendly terms. So how do we take what we just kind of talked about and um, and translate it into a child friendly definition of a substance use disorder or addiction for children. Um, I think just in general, before we talk about defining substance use disorders for children, um, I would just uh, like to remind you that when talking to children, it's really important to make sure that our language is concrete um, and to avoid the use of metaphorical language. Um, and the reason we recommend this is because what we know of, child, of children's brain development. Um, so for example, um, Something that I commonly see here at hospice is when uh, someone that we love has died, um, we maybe are uncomfortable using the word died or death or dying with children. And so we'll try to soften it a little bit and we might say that so-and-so went to heaven. Um, and because children don't have the ability, that cognitive ability or that developmental um, trait of having metaphorical language of understanding that that means that the person actually died. I mean, if you or I, if you're an adult with your adult brain, we know that that's a metaphor for that the person died. But children may not be able to understand that the person died if we say something like they went to heaven. They actually might think that the person moved. So they might envision you know, their person getting up out of the hospital bed and packing a bag and getting in the car and driving to this place called heaven and how far away is, uh, is heaven and when is that person coming back and why did they leave? Um, and so it, it's really important that we use concrete language that so-and-so's body stopped working and they died. And then if your spiritual beliefs or your religious beliefs are that the spirit or the soul goes to heaven, you can talk about after you've talked about the body stopping working and the body dying, you might talk about the part that's not the body, the spirit or the soul that goes to heaven. Um, so 
that's why it's really important for us to use really concrete language. It's also really important to name the illness directly and not just to say that the person is sick. Um, to, when we use these kind of vague terms, there is always this chance that um, children will, their imaginations will fill in the gaps and often it's a lot more scary than the truth. Um, and so we, we don't want them to think that a person died. You know, I think a really common way that we might describe when someone has died of a substance use disorder, we might say that so-and-so was really sick and then they died. And we don't want children to be concerned that the next time that a person gets uh, in their family, like the flu um, or a cold, we don't want them worrying that that person is also going to die. So it's really important that we talk about that the person had um, a substance use disorder or an addiction and not just say the word sick. This is true for any illness. We talk about the importance of saying when someone has cancer or, um, or, an, or another really serious illness. Um, so we might talk about substance use disorders or addiction uh, being a type of mental illness. Um, some children may have an idea of what mental illness is. Um, they talk a little bit more about it in schools these days, um, but if they don't know what a mental illness is, then we might have to do a little bit of back explaining that before we move on. Um, the way that I explain mental illness to children is saying that it's like a sickness in your brain. Um, and just like our bodies can get sick, our brains and minds can also get sick. Um, you might say that substance use disorders or addictions um, are an invisible disease, so a disease that's on the inside, you can't really see it on the outside, that causes a person to use more and more, you can say alcohol, medicine, drugs, substances, uh, whatever information you have, then is safe, even when that person knows it's not good for them or bad things start to happen. Um, when someone has the sickness in their brain or the mental illness called addiction, they have a really, really strong urge to use substances, um, but it makes it difficult to think about anything else. And it might start to get in the way of other things in that person's life, like going to work or spending time with their family. Um, sometimes a person's body may become dependent on the substance. And this means that they might start to feel really, really sick if they stop taking it, which makes it difficult to stop. And it's important to know that even though we can't see mental illnesses on the outside, we remember that the person's brain is sick and that it's the sickness in their brain that's the cause of the addiction and not our fault. The reason that we uh, have to kind of talk about that, that idea that it's not our fault is because of what we know again about children's development and this idea of magical thinking, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but it's important to say to children, especially younger children, that nothing you say or think can make a person get sick, can make their body stop working, um, or can make them use alcohol. It's that person's choice and it's the sickness in their brain that's causing it and not anything that we did. Let's talk about this idea of, you know, to tell or not to tell. Do we talk to children about um, substance use disorders? Uh, do we tell them the truth if a person has died from an accidental overdose? And just some considerations that I would um, encourage you to keep in mind if this is where you're at and you're really struggling with whether or not to tell a child that you have in your life about um, substance use disorders or about a substance use disorder related death. Um, so the first consideration is, um, is magical thinking. So, I, and I mean, just to kind of back up a little bit, when we talk about more stigmatized losses like overdoses, um, like suicide, whether or not to tell the child the truth of how the person died is probably the most common concern that families have when they come here for services. And this comes from a really human place of wanting to protect our children. Um, and maybe also, you know, not knowing how to explain a very complex social problem like substance use, um, or even because of stigma, right? Um, this might be, there, there may be, has never been a conversation that's been had in this family or in the family about substance use or about the person's substance use. Um, and stigma can be very, um, it's, it's like silencing, right? It's shame. Um, I think also that there's this concern that the truth somehow will be damaging to the child or that the child may be more likely to either, um, they'd be more likely to uh, engage with substances, like they might be more likely to use substances if we're talking about substance use, or for example, if um, the death is by suicide, the concern is that if we tell the child about suicide or tell the child the truth that they 
their, re their risk for dying by suicide would then increase. Um, and I just want you to know that these ideas are not supported by research. So what we know about what the research says, that's what's, what is best for children. And what we recommend at ho hospice is to always tell children the truth about the death regardless of the child's age and regardless of the type of death or how the death has happened. Now, obviously, the way that you would explain um, a death from substances to a five-year-old would be very different than the way you would explain it to a 12-year-old. But just this idea that children um, can be told the truth and it can be protective. It doesn't increase the risk, it actually decreases it. Um, again, we're, it's really important that we are using concrete age appropriate language and we're also following the child's lead so we're not giving them too much information or more information than they asked for um, but that's this idea that they can they are capable of hearing the truth um, there is a way that we can explain it where we are telling the children the truth and that that is actually a protective factor and not something that would increase their risk so Jumping back to this idea of magical thinking, this is like a hallmark, um, like developmental trait of children. Um, this idea that my inner world, my thoughts and my feelings have real world impacts, right? If we think about magical thinking, it's about, it's, you know, that imaginative play, all the wonderful things about being a child. Um, and so this idea that if we're too vague with the details that we're giving, the child's imagination is going to fill in the gaps for them. And often it is more scary than the truth. I've definitely had clients over the years who um, maybe their family was not um, really detailed when they talked to the child about the death and um, they might have just said that so-and-so um, so -and -so just died. We don't really know why. Um, and I've had children tell me that they believe that their person was murdered and that there, there's this scary person out there who, um, who's on the loose and who could come and uh, come and hurt the rest of their family, right? Um, so that it's really important to think about that when we are telling children. And um, if we leave out too many details that there's this idea that they're going to fill in the gaps themselves. And so we kind of want to, as the adults, be in control of um, the narrative and the details that they have. Um, the other idea that I would like you to think about, and again, this is, I've definitely observed this over the years, is that if we don't tell children the truth, there's always a chance that they may hear details from others. Um, I've had many clients over the years who heard details about the death either from like another adult overhearing a conversation maybe at the visitation or the funeral um, hearing from like a classmate at school um, and so you know we again as the adults we want to be in control of how our children find out those details and we want to make sure that they're they're coming from us and not from someone else um, this idea that trust is a key resilience factor in children so this this idea that um, if I'm a child that I can trust the caregivers in my life that to be honest with me, that they're going to support me. Um, and this is something that actually adds to a child's resilience and doesn't take away from. Um, and this, again, we've kind of talked about this already, but this idea that children knowing the truth is protective. It, it does not increase their risk to know the truth about someone's substance use disorder or their death from substances. Knowing the truth is protective. It, it does not, it, it decreases their risk. Um, and then this idea of um, stigma, right? Um, again, maybe the person's substance use was like just an unspoken um, elephant in the room in the family. And I know that this can make it really, really challenging to have these conversations, especially if maybe the child had no idea that the person even had a substance use disorder. When that person um, dies from a, uh, an accidental overdose, there's a lot of explaining and layers that we have to kind of go back and talk to children about. Um, and so one of the things we can talk about with kids is stigma. And probably the way that I would explain stigma to children would be something along the lines of saying, you know, that people, um, people often don't want to let others know about, about their substance use. They might worry that other people will treat them differently or that they'll think that they're bad. Um, but we know um, that it's because of the sickness in their brain and not because they're bad that they, um, they have a substance use disorder. Um, or they might feel really ashamed for, for using substances. And so when we're talking about that with kids, it kind of can help explain those things. Um, 
The uh, picture in this slide is an article from Chatelaine Magazine, which is Canadian, um, and the woman in the photo is named Sarah Keast, and she um, wrote this, uh, the headline of this article. She also has a TED Talk called uh, Your Empathy Can Save a Life. She um, is from Toronto, and she shares her story in her TED Talk and also in this article. Um, and you know, they're uh, kind of that picture perfect family. Uh, both her and her spouse were had really good jobs, university educated, and for years her spouse struggled with a, a secret addiction. He would use heroin in their uh, laundry room, and unfortunately, he died from an accidental overdose. And so she shares her story of that experience of stigma and. The thing that seemed, that always stuck out to me reading her story and listening to her speak was that, um, you know, she was talking about the day of her his funeral. Um, and when a young person dies, there's always, obviously lots and lots of people. There's hundreds of people at this funeral. And she said that there was only a fraction of everybody who was attending this funeral that had any idea that he had died from substances or that he had been struggling with it. Um, and uh, so it's a really powerful story. I would encourage you to um, read it or look at her TED Talk if you're if you're interested. Um, so I'd like to talk kind of about a specific kind of grief. At hospice, we do lots of public education on grief, um, but we, I really want to spend some time talking about this specific kind of grief called disenfranchised grief. Um, so disenfranchised grief refers to a loss that is not socially sanctioned or openly acknowledged or talked about or publicly mourned. Um, and there are five different contexts in which grief may be disenfranchised. So if your relationship with your person is not recognized, um, so perhaps it's an extramarital affair, nobody realized that you were in a relationship with that person. Um, if you're a same-sex couple and uh, one of you is not out to your family and so people aren't aware again that you're in this relationship. Um, we tend to do this, I think, with also um, unmarried people. If you're not married, um, then that some, sometimes, I don't know, for some reason seems to be different than if you were married. So if you're just a common law couple, um, if the loss is not recognized. Um, so we might say that like for pets, for kids, we don't really recognize that as a loss. Um, infertility, stillborn, miscarriage, any like kind of perinatal losses, we don't often acknowledge as kind of legitimate loss, legitimate grief. Um, if the griever is not recognized, so we often will say that the really elderly and then really young children are not often recognized as legitimate grievers who kind of have a right to be um, at the table when it comes to grief and loss. Uh, but if the death or loss is stigmatized, so for example, if it is by an accidental overdose, if it's by suicide, um, if substances are related to the death, like drinking and driving, that kind of thing, um, or the ways in which individuals grieve. So it's important for us to be aware of this idea of disenfranchised grief because, so first of all, children's grief is often disenfranchised on its own because children are not recognized as legitimate grievers. Um, I think this is that children grieve differently than adults. They present very differently than adults in their grief. And so then we as adults expect them to grieve like we do. And when they don't present that way, then we assume the child is fine or that they're not grieving. Um, and then we're not as likely to recognize them as that kind of legitimate griever. Um, and then also because death uh, by substance use is a stigmatized death. So we have this really high likelihood that um, if there's a child and the death has been from substances, that there's going to be some disenfranchised grief there. And so it's um, a what, uh, good for us to be aware of this idea. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time to talk today about the difference between children's grief and adults' grief or, and how kind of they present differently. But I will just share with you that um, when we're thinking about how children grieve and how it's different than adults, is this idea that children grieve in chunks or this idea of puddle jumping. So when we think of um, as an adult experiencing grief, it's like being in this deep dark ocean all the time. You are constantly in that space. Um, there's lots and lots of emotions. Whereas for children, they will puddle jump, what we call it. So they'll jump into the puddle and when they're in that puddle, it's as if they're in that big deep dark ocean, we have lots of emotions. And then they jump out of the puddle and they're onto doing the next thing. So I've I've had parents before kind of, um, you know, call me after they've had a conversation with their child and they say, you know, I, I sat them down, I, I 
I did all the things that you said to you and my child was really upset when they found out that the person had died and they cried for about 10 minutes and then they said, can I go play outside? And so then the child, uh, the adult is saying like, did I not explain correctly? Like, did I not do this right? Like they were really upset for a second, but then they seemed fine. And so we just need to know that that's what children's grief looks like. They jump into the puddle, they experience it really intensely, and then they're on to doing the next thing. And so for us as adults, we need to be aware of what children's grief look like, looks like and support the child when they're in that puddle, but also support them when they're out of the puddle. So, you know, not chasing after them and saying, wait, 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 come back here. If they are saying that they, you know, want to go play outside, then we have to um, let them do that and then just be aware and waiting for the next time that they're in a puddle and then we'll support them there. I hope that makes sense. So this, we'll talk about a few uh, different child friendly um, definitions. So uh, when I talk to children about the word died or dead, I say that it's when the body stops working and, uh, and never works again. So we might say that, you know, the person's heart stops beating, uh, their breathing stops, they can't see, hear, feel, think anymore. I'll often talk with children about, you know, if I touch somebody whose body has died, can they feel me touching them? Um, and that's really important to talk about if we're going to be talking about maybe something like cremation or burial later. Um, so it's when the body stops working. That's what died means. Um, grief is all of the different feelings and thoughts that happen or that come after someone you love uh, has died. Uh, cremation, I, so I think there's a lot of anxiety about cremation and how to explain it to kids because of like fire. Um, and if we've done a really good job of explaining that the body has stopped working, then cremation is no more um, damaging or traumatic to talk about than putting our loved ones in the ground. Uh, so we might say that uh, cremation is when a dead body, so we talked about how the body has stopped working, the person can't feel anymore, is put through very high heat, causing it to break down into very small pieces that look like sand or dirt. Or we could say um, when the body is put in a room that gets very hot and the body turns to ash. So again, really important to make sure that we've, we've gone over what dead means and that the body can't feel anymore. Suicide is when, so if died is when someone's body stops working. Suicide is when someone does something to make their body stop working and the body dies. And an accidental overdose would be when a person at either accidentally or mistakenly takes too much of a substance, drug, or medicine that's more than their body can handle and the body stops working. And we'll get a little bit more into specifics of how we might explain that. Okay. So now we're gonna talk about how do we actually sit a child down um, and have a conversation with them about substance use disorders and about a death from substance use disorder. Um, when deciding where to start, I think it's important to consider the child's age, but also their previous knowledge of, of the substance use disorder. Um, maybe we're explaining that a person has died by substances and the child has had no idea that the person died from substance, like had they even had a substance use disorder. Um, or it could be a time where maybe we've had a conversation, the child knows that the person has died and we're wanting to go back and just share a little bit more information about actually how they died. Um, so it, it depends, we'll kind of talk about both options, but um, it depends where, where, at what point in the child's journey you're having this conversation. Um, so I recommend, you know, finding a quiet, comfortable space, um, a place where the child feels safe, where there's going to be minimal disturbances um, to get right on the child's level. Um, if the child is already aware that the death has happened, I might start by asking them if they could explain what their understanding is. So, you know, I might just say like, um, I'm wondering if you can share with me your understanding about so-and-so and how they died. Um, and then I would kind of go from there. Um, I would start with uh, like a short, simple explanation of what happened in language that children can understand using the appropriate language, died or dead. Um, we'll talk about some actual phrases that you can use in a little bit. Um, and from there, follow the child's lead and allow their questions to guide wh where you go next with the conversation. Um, it's important to remember like this idea of if the child is old enough to ask, they're old enough to hear the answer. Um, but I would also encourage everyone to only answer the questions that are being asked. So try to resist the urge of giving too much information. We're just following the child's lead um, and trying to keep your explanations concrete and anatomical. What do I mean when I say anatomical? Um, I would 
I think it means like avoiding kind of really explicit imagery um, and language and really breaking down step by step what happens in the body. So for example, we might say, you know, that so-and-so took too much of a drug called fentanyl and fentanyl, when you take too much of it, it can really slow down your breathing. So the fentanyl slowed down their breathing so much that it actually stopped their breathing. Um, and then we know if a person isn't breathing, that they're not, their body and their brain aren't getting enough oxygen in their body. And if a body doesn't get enough oxygen to their brain, then eventually the body will shut down, the body will stop working, and the person will die. That's what I mean when I'm talking about um, kind of anatomical. And that's only if a child is asking, well, wait, what actually, how did they actually, how did their body actually stop working after taking too much of this medicine? I wouldn't necessarily share that with a child unless they were asking. Um, while we're having this conversation, I would recommend having a variety of outlets kind of available. Um, this conversation may happen over several, like this may not be one conversation, it may be happening over several, the child might need a break, they might need to go run around outside. Um, I usually will have like markers, pencil crayons, um, like art materials if they want to, you know, draw out their feelings or write their personal letter. Um, and just so that they have lots of different avenues to kind of express themselves. Um, acknowledge your child's feelings without trying to, you know, fix or trick or correct or trying to change the feeling. This can be really, really challenging um, as parents because again, we don't want our children to experience pain. Um, and so we just have to resist that urge to, you know, put a silver lining on things or to make it better or to kind of take away your child's, you know, the child's pain. Sometimes we say, you know, you had so many good memories with that person. And um, if you can, try to just sit with the child's emotions and mirror it back to them. Um, so just saying, you know, you feel so sad or you're so angry, you're so mad that so-and-so died, you just want to see them. Um, and so just every, every feeling they share, we're just acknowledging it and mirroring it back to them. And then also, now that we know, you know, how children's grief looks different than adult grief, we're going to be watching out for those chunks or that puddle jumping. Um, and so the child may need to take lots of breaks and just follow their lead. So we're going to watch out for puddle jumping. I think um, re when we're talking about grief, but really when we're talking about any really challenging emotion or big feeling, the only thing worse, I think, than having these really distressing or big feelings is that feeling of being alone with that feeling. So if we can um, make our child feel like we see them, that we acknowledge their feelings, um, it, it doesn't make things better. It doesn't take away that feeling, but at least they feel seen and heard and like they're not alone with that feeling. So that's something that I always try to bear in mind. Um, kind of continuing on. So again, try as much as possible to be honest. It's okay if you don't know the answer. I, in my practice, lean heavily on I don't know. Um, and sometimes it's an I don't know, uh, but I can find that information for you. Like maybe I just need to do some research or talk to a family member and come back to the child and get, uh, give them an answer. Um, but sometimes it's um, I don't know because you know human beings are complex and there's a lot of mystery in life. And um, I think sometimes for children, hearing an adult who is supposed to be you know completely capable and competent saying i don't know can really be anxiety reducing for children like this idea of oh this this adult that's supposed to know everything doesn't actually know this oh, so it's okay if i don't know it either and again we're going to avoid um, sugar coating or deflecting difficult conversations we're going to lean into that we're going to answer the child's questions as best as we can using that concrete developmentally appropriate language um, we're going to let our child know that they are safe they're loved that they're they are taken care of and they're going to be taken care of um, we might kind of as this conversation develops if it's over you know several days or weeks we might check in regularly and just remind the child that they can ask you questions at any time um, another thing to be aware of is just uh, giving the child kind of this wraparound support system so we might be making sure that um, other important adults in the child's life are available or are aware about this like teachers coaches other parents um, you might say you know this is what's going on for so and so and this is how we're explaining it in case they ask you um, and just um, just so that you're aware so we have this kind of lots of support available to this child 
Um, and then also this idea of sharing our grief with our children. Um, I've definitely talked to lots of parents over the years who um, it's very uncomfortable for them to share their grief with their children, uncomfortable to, for example, cry in front of their children. Um, but, you know, the best way to get your child to engage in the behavior you want to see is by modeling it for them. Um, so if we want our children to be open with their grief and share their grief with us, we have to put a little bit of skin in the game and to share our grief with them as well. Um, and to make those really big feelings not so scary by, by sharing like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm crying because I'm really sad and I miss this person, um, but I don't need you to fix my sadness. It's okay. Like it feels good for me to let my tears out sometimes um, and it's okay to cry. So. I just encourage caregivers to, um, yeah, to share their grief with their children. We're going to, because we're, we're trying to model the behavior that we want to see. Um, St. Joseph's Hospice. So again, if this is you and you're in this aftermath of a substance use related death and you're wanting to have this conversation and you want some support, St. Joseph's Hospice is available to support you with these conversations. We can have, I do lots of work with parents and caregivers on how to have this kind of conversation and to um, support kids through it. Um, and so if this is something that you feel you need more support with, please reach out to us. Um, another kind of furthering on this idea of the importance of language, um, when we're talking to children about substance use disorders, about substance use related deaths, um, we want to be aware of the language that we're using um, because language is one of the, it's a if we can shift our language, it's one of the ways that we can decrease stigma and shame. Um, so, you know, avoiding words like this idea of like addict or abuser, or clean, that kind of thing, instead of saying, or instead saying, you know, that so-and-so struggled with substance use, they had a substance use disorder, um, their body became dependent on medication or they had a disease that made them use more substances than was safe for their body. So we're kind of emphasizing the worth of the person who died rather than labeling them based on how they died. Um, and that this idea that, you know, we're, this person is not defined by their substance use disorder. Um, it's that they, they are a person with a substance use disorder, a person who struggled with a substance use disorder um, instead of being defined by, by that. So these are just some examples of when we're talking about, you know, start off with that simple short explanations um, and then and then following the child's lead from there. Um, these are just some examples, uh, some phrases that I have pulled, uh, ways that we can kind of that provide that short ex explanation. So you might say your dad died last night. His liver stopped working from drinking more alcohol than was safe for his body. I have very sad news. Mommy died of something called an overdose. She took more medication than the doctor told her to, and it made her body stop working. For this one, um, if we're, we know that the person maybe struggles with prescription drugs or prescription medications, um, it's important for us to talk about like the person who used more medicine than, uh, than their doctor was prescribed as safe to use, because we don't want children having a fear of taking medicine. Um, you know, and, and also children may be aware that maybe the person had a painful condition, like a chronic pain situation or um, was recovering from an accident or an injury, um, but not aware that the person was um, maybe abusing the, the medication. Um, so we really want to highlight the importance, like that's why it's really important that we, when we, when the doc, we only uh, take what the doctor recommends, the, the recommended dosage when they give us medication. Um, we might say your sister died last night from an overdose of a drug called heroin. We don't know if she took too much on purpose or by accident. He died due to liver failure and complications of alcoholism. She died from taking too many drugs. She died from an accidental overdose. By using these kind of short, concrete statements, we are not only helping children um, understand what's happened, but we're also helping kids formulate their own narrative of what happened and how this death fits into their life story, um, which is a crucial element in, 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 in grief, um, is being able to tell the story of the death and where it sits in the, in the child's life. Um, and so not only are we kind of helping children understand what actually happened when we use this kind of language, but we're also helping them to tell their own story or to put this story into their, put this into their own story, if that makes sense.
Um, we use uh, a lot of uh, books as a way to um, talk with children about death loss and trauma. Um, they're a great way to help kids, yeah, kind of talk about these more abstract ideas, but it's also a great tool for parents to have as a guide um, to go from when they're trying to explain tough topics to children. So, I mean, I'm in this world every day. I'm in the world of explaining death and dying to children, explaining substance use, explaining accidental overdoses. Um, and I can appreciate if you as a parent or a caregiver or a professional aren't necessarily comfortable being in that space all the time because your job isn't the same as mine. So having um, a book to kind of do the explaining for you or for you to check back on might be really, really helpful. Um, in this list, my favorites for explaining death and dying are I Miss You and When Dinosaurs Die. When Dinosaurs Die actually briefly talks about suicide and accidental overdose or about substance use. Um, when someone very special dies and when a family is in trouble, there are actually activity books that a child can um, like doodle and draw and color in. Um, and then wherever you are, my love will find you in the invisible string. They're not necessarily about um, explaining death and dying to children, but more about that continuing relationship. Um, so it depends on what your goals are. But I would say that if you are looking to explain death and dying to kids, that the yeah, I Miss You book and When Dinosaurs Die would be your best place to start. I um, would like to kind of head toward the ending of our time together with a quote by Fred Rogers from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Um, it is only natural that we and our children find many things hard to talk about, but anything human is mentionable and anything mentionable can be manageable. The mentioning can be difficult and the managing too, but both can be done if we're surrounded by love and trust. So again, it's just this idea that, you know, if we can make these things a little bit more okay to talk about with our kids, they will fare far better than if we hide it from them or if we make it so that it's unmentionable. Um, and not to say that bringing those things to the surface and telling the truth about them makes the managing any easier, but it can be as long as the child is supported by um, or surrounded by supportive adults who care about them, then we can get through it together. And again, there's lots of supports available. We'll talk about resources in a little bit, but you're also, you know, um, there's support available at the hospice as well. So some different um, resources that I found when I was doing my research for this presentation. So KMH has a, a great resource uh, called When a Parent Drinks Too Much Alcohol, What Kids Want to Know. Um, you can easily adjust the language to uh, substances, I would say. Uh, so if maybe you're talking to a child about a substance use disorder that isn't alcohol related, you can, I would recommend using this as a guide, but then maybe changing the language to substances instead of alcohol. Um, it helps really answer questions like, why does my person do this? Um, and it breaks down substance use in child-friendly terms. It's not death and dying related. It's just for explaining a substance use disorder. And the Dougie Center is an incredible resource. They have so many different tip sheets um, on their website. And one of the tip sheets that they have is called Supporting Children and Teens When Someone Dies from Substance Use. And uh, it's a, like a three-page tip sheet, it kind of breaks everything down, has some recommendations for how you might share the information with children. Um, Dr. J's Children's Grief Center, they're actually based out of Toronto, and they have a web page called Out of the Shadows Supporting Children and Youth Grieving a Substance Use Related Death. So on that web page, they actually have a webinar that's um, about two hours long, so a little bit more in-depth than um, the information that we've been talking about today on talking to children about substance use and substance use related deaths. And then they have a list of resources um, that you can find. Some of them are more GTA based, but then there are some um, like electronic web based resources as well. Um, Our House Grief Support Center has an, also a tip sheet called Explaining Death by Overdose to Children. Um, again, we talked about Sarah Keith's TED Talk that your empathy can save a life. Um, and then another resource that's available is uh, at St. Joseph's Hospice. So we provide individual counseling for children and youth. We also can provide that psychoeducational support for parents and caregivers. Um, again, like how do we support children who are grieving? How do we explain death and dying to children? How does children's grief look different than adult grief and what should I be aware of? That kind of thing. And then we also have um, a YouTube series um, called, we call them our caregiver modules. 
Uh, so we used to, uh, before the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we would run a uh, parent or caregiver group concurrently at the same time as our children's grief group. So, you know, the children would come downstairs and work with myself and some volunteers, and then another staff member would be running this educational group for the parents um, in another room of hospice. Um, and so trying to be creative in the COVID-19 pandemic, we decided to record ourselves um, going over the material for the caregiver group and make that available on our YouTube uh, page. So uh, there's five different modules. Each one has a different topic um, and they range in, in length. I think the longest one's probably about an hour, a little bit longer, and then the shorter ones are more like 45 minutes. Um, and so you can access those on our YouTube page. You can scroll through or only watch, you know, the sections that you think are um, applicable to you. Um, but that's uh, another resource that's available. And that's more kind of general, uh, general grief uh, information about children, um, not as much getting into the specifics of different types of loss, if that makes sense. So if you have any questions about um, any of the information that you've heard today, um, please feel free uh, to reach out to me. Uh, my email uh, and phone number and extension are listed here, um, and I am more than happy to talk with people about, um, about how to explain death and dying to children or how to support people in supporting their children. So if you're still watching, I would just like to thank you for um, coming along with me today and for um, you know, listening and spend, you know, spending your time uh, and energy uh, talking about uh, children and talking to them about substance use related disorders and death. Um, and uh, please know that at St. Joseph's Hospice, we're here to support you. And if you are feeling that you need that extra support, then please reach out to us. Thanks very much.